Welcome to another episode of Costume Cinematographico. In the fourth and final episode on this series of the Costumes of Westeros, I continue my exploration of the continent of Westeros from the world of Game of Thrones from the HBO series by the same name. If you haven't seen episodes one through three from my series on Westeros, I'll leave a link in the description below, although you can watch it out of order. And there will be spoilers for everything that's happened so far in the show, but I'll also be showing some images from the Game of Thrones season seven teasers and trailers. So just so you know, you have been warned. Dragonstone is the ancestral seat of House Targaryen, and it was the stronghold and currently extinct cadet branch of House Baratheon. And while I was lurking through some of the Reddit discussions, and that's where I get some of my best information actually, many of the armor aficionados on there have stated that Stannis Baratheon's armor is the best in the series. So Michelle Clapton says of this, I don't think that Stannis is a sort of Joffrey. He's not trying to show that he's king. He just believes he is. This is his look and what it will always be. So Stannis wears the newly formed House Baratheon of Dragonstone Sigil, which is a crowned black stag enclosed within the fiery red heart of the Lord of Light. And that's riveted on his breastplate. He wears a full coat of mail over his leather gambeson, and that's covered with purpose in soft areas with metal plate. His gorget and breastplate protect the neck and chest, and the waist plates protect his vital organs, while the plates on his skirt work in the same way as fods do in plate armor to protect the legs and hips. His men, including Davos, wear variations of Stannis' uniform, and they carry kite shields and banners with the house sigil. While some of the plates are actually linked into the mail, the chest piece is an add-on piece with the waist plates fastened to the breastplate with leather straps. And here's Stannis with Selyse just standing behind him. He wears a leather gambeson with what looks like a leather vest top. Although after I was looking at it a bit closer, I think it's actually one piece. And it's got this really amazing, crunchy, leathery texture to it. I especially love his cape with the leather clasps at the shoulder. And it looks like a, a sort of like a drawn Roman shade, if you know what I mean. And his belt, if you look closely, has a tiny Baratheon stag detail on it. Stannis' men all wear this particular style of this visored helmet with cheek guards. It looks similar to this German burgonet seen on the left. And the one on the right is a German burgonet from about 1570. Now, George R. R. Martin loves female characters with postpartum psychosis, I've detected, and we can look no further than Celise Baratheon to rival Lisa Aaron as one of the nuttiest moms. So her clothes, they look nothing special on camera. Her hair being one of the most unflattering styles in this series, I think. I actually found it surprising that a woman of her station would dress so unfine. But upon closer inspection, her clothes are actually quite beautiful. Her coat here is wool or a low pile fur and it's lined and bound in leather. And the gown underneath appears to be velvet, I think, with a gore in the front, just below the waist, with a short rabbit muffler or a little like a little short scarf at the neck. And the best part, of course, is this lovely silvery chain belt with the stag in the center to anchor it. And I can't tell what the links are made from, but possibly I thought they might be stag skulls. Hard to know um, since Clapton has been mum on the issue. And this is the same outfit except without the rabbit scarf. Celise comes from the Reach and while her family sigil for House Florent is a red fox on an ermine background, she wears neither furs in her clothing. So upon closer inspection, we can see that Celise wears a Baratheon stag ring on her uh, ring finger. And here we see a linen shift underneath. I find this to be very similar to the Starks. And we also get a glimpse of the Baratheon of Dragonstone sigil on her gown. Here's a close-up that I found of the embroidered crest and I've taken it from Michelle Carragher's website. Princess Shireen's monochromatic clothing appears to be homespun and again, not necessarily befitting a princess, 
But given that she is hidden away, her mother, Celise, is devoutly religious, and she doesn't dote on her in the least, she would most likely be given something simple and more practical style clothing. So her clothing, like the Starks, is most likely locally sourced. It's dyed and handcrafted, made from things like cotton, linen, and wool. And here's a close-up look at the fabric on, of her jacket. You can see it's just got like this really very subtle texture to it. Shireen wears this woolly capelette with a little stag closure just before her short life comes to an end. And in Greek tragedy fashion, her mother, Celise, hangs herself off stage. Here is one of Michelle Clapton's initial designs for Danny. She kind of looks like her brother Viserys in this sketch. This costume looks most like the dress that we see in the first teaser. And according to the sketch, Michelle Clapton has orig had originally intended Danny's cape to be lined in fur or sheep. And it also has a neighbor collar, which Clapton only uses on her fourth look, as you'll see a bit later. And Clapton says of her new look for season seven, she's this figurehead of her army. I wanted her to be able to stand in front of the unsullied and to be their leader. The rigid collar is cobra shaped, a throwback to her earlier marine costumes in Essos. Not dragon per se, but reptilian nonetheless. Clapton says about Danny's lack of a crown in a recent Uproxx interview. She can't have a crown, she hasn't conquered yet, but I love this idea of this chain of intent. I think it's quite interesting that we finally see her embracing her brother's ambition. You are seeing the beginning of something. We're not at the end yet, and I think it's very important at this moment that we start seeing who she is. Here's an actual cobra so that you can see the shape that Michelle Clapton was going for with the collar. In these close-up shots, I'll admit they're not the greatest, but I have a better idea of what is going on here. So what initially looked like a tweed is actually a silvery gray black scaly reptile like fabric that has been brushed with some red paint. And as I mentioned before, the texture of the cape, it's a flat chevron pleat, and the skirt is sunburst pleats, which are done by British pleaters cement pleating. And finally, the bespoke silver chain or custom chain. There is a hidden loop that holds the cape up. Michelle Clapton might have commissioned that from Eunice and Eliza, I suspect, the British jewelry designers who created all of Danny's jewelry from season six. And it's a three-headed dragon with a chain, perhaps uh, vertebrae or skulls, but it could be teeth. So if you want to let me know in the comments below what you think it is, uh, I'd appreciate that. Here's another outfit I already addressed in the other video from the HBO promo. I mentioned that this asymmetrical style is Asian inspired and clearly influenced by Viserys, whose clothing is Targaryen, as opposed to Danny's first look, which is a Pentoshi look. And here's another image of Viserys. This Targaryen garment is charcoal black with just a few touches of dark red. It's almost burgundy red. So you can see how Danny has been influenced by this look. Viewer Paige Lessa Tamari pointed out to me that Danny's new costume reminds her of Mongolian riders, and I'd have to say that I agree with her. So here's a picture that she provided me, the one on the left of the couple dressed in, Mo in Mongolian deal. It's a traditional kaftan or tunic made from cotton, silk, or wool, or sometimes brocade. And as Paige points out, the man's collar and cuffs are trimmed in fur, well, the ones we saw of Danny's are actually lined in fur, but you can definitely see how Michelle Clapton might have been influenced by the Mongol people. And the deal on the right shows the sheep, uh, sheep wool lining instead. So Paige also says that Danny might have chosen this style of clothing as homage to Drogo, since the Dothraki are based on the Mongolians. And I'm going to get more into the Dothraki in my future video. And Danny's third look is this outfit. So it's an amalgamation of all her outfits. The collar is Targaryen with a Japanese right over left collar with a cobra shaping. All of her collars are rigid and, and somewhat armor-like. The dress itself is a more modest Carthine look with no cutouts or bare skin. 
and it's got the empire waist with two skirt slits which are inspired by the indian kurti and the long hanging sleeves and she's been wearing those for the last two seasons in case you hadn't noticed and she has fitted sleeves now of course because it's getting colder Danny's Japanese inspired clothing also reminds me of this samurai wearing an ensemble, which is known as a kamishimo, which is a style of popular that was popular during the Edo period in Japan. And his outer garment is what looks like shoulder pads is called a kataginu, which kind of again reminds me of her cobra style collar that she wears. Danny wears trousers and suede boots. They've always been slightly darker than the dress itself. And Michelle Clapton has made it this way since the beginning for a quick getaway, but also so Danny can ride those dragons and not get chafed. In this close up, you can see that Danny is wearing her mother's ring. There is lots of embroidery here. Michelle Carragher has covered the bodice with a red feather stitch. Uh, dragon scale smocking and these metal fasteners here that kind of look like dragon claws and it's important to note that while the Targaryen colors from their family sigil are black and red Clapton hasn't gone full-blown and I think if she does I suspect she'll hold back until we get to the eighth and final season and if you're looking for a suitable fabric to create Danny's recent look, I found this lovely reversible silk double cloth from Mood Fabrics in New York City that I think might work nicely. And it has textured slubs on the one side and a plush twill on the other side, which could be used uh, for the lining. In these close-ups, you can see that the embroidery wraps around the cape sleeves and the feather stitch continues down the seam of the fitted sleeves and spills out onto the, onto the cuffs. You can see the dragon scale smocking apply to the sleeves in a matching fabric. On the collar are a series of red ruby and pewter beads that create the dragon scale texture. By the way, uh, costume embroiderer Michelle Carragher has said on her Facebook page that her first port of call for embroidery threads and beads is the London Bee Company in London, England. And I'll leave the link in the description below so that you can also purchase this very same embroidery floss and Mayuki seed beads that she uses on Danny's costumes, that is, if you'll be in London. Here is a fourth look for Daenerys, a textured silver Carthine style gown with a stand-up Nehru style collar. So the hourglass shaping, it comes from these princess seams and you can really see how small Amelia Clark is in this dress. The underskirt again is sunburst pleated and the sleeves have a really nice lacing detail. And she's wearing her three headed dragon pin without the chain or it might be a completely separate piece, I'm not sure exactly. And one final thing I will add is that the opening has moved away from the arch. It used to be sort of a curved shape, and now it is shaped more hexagonal, like the stone floor in the throne room. So I'm not sure if that's coincidence uh, or if it's something more symbolic. The Reach, ruled by House Tyrell of Highgarden, is one of the constituent regions of the Seven Kingdoms. It is the most fertile and heavily populated part of Westeros, helping supply other less fertile parts of the Seven Kingdoms, including King's Landing. The Reach is also one of the richest regions, second only to the Westerlands, ruled by House Lannister. House Tyrell of Highgarden is one of the great houses of Westeros. The Tyrells rule over the Reach from their castle seat, Highgarden. I mentioned in another video that while the Lannisters dress in red, like the Capulets and Romeo and Juliet, the Tyrells, who are their rival family, dress in blues and teals mixed with gold. The Tyrells like to show their wealth and opulence through their clothing, wearing exquisite imported floral silk brocades, luscious silk velvet and dupioni silk fastened with gold and bronze clasps and fasteners and decorated with a bronze casting of their family sigil, the Tyrell Rose. I have a dedicated video to the costumes of Marjorie Terrell if you want to check that out, so I'll leave a link in the description below for that. Mace Tyrell, the family patriarch and former head of House Tyrell, while a bit of a buffoon and looking a bit like the Wizard of Oz, I might add, dresses in Renaissance-style finery, silk jacquard jerkins and doublets. 
Mace wears elephant closures on the right outfit, and I'm not sure what the significance is there, although considering their garments are made from imports, it's possible that they are a Far East export. And one little detail I love here is that Mace's cravat is folded orig sort of origami style into a rose. We first meet Mace's son and heir, Sir Loris Terrell, a popular jousting tourney knight in Westeros in season one. He is commonly known as the Knight of Flowers, wearing full plate armor elaborately engraved and embossed with flowers from his family's sigil. In reality, however, there was a great difference between the weight of battle armor versus jousting armor. So just to give you an example, a complete set of well, a suit of well-tempered steel plate armor would weigh around 15 to 25 kilos, while specialized jousting armor produced in the late 15th to 16th century could weigh as much as 50 kilos. Loris' house and shield are both decorated with his family sigil, and you'll notice that the shield has a notch or mouth cut out of it, and this is to accommodate the lance so that it can pass through. Here Loris wears battle armor under the banner of Renly Baratheon, and his plate armor is still decorated with flowers, but it's just a lot less ornate and shiny. He also wears brass, a brass mail, hauberk, and gorget. Loris has very fine clothing, by the way, and you might even say that he dresses a little bit like a Victorian dandy. So many of his shirt sleeves are gathered with what's called honeycomb smocking, like these two seen here. And I haven't seen this technique on any other character with the exception of Danny's dragon scale smocking with this type of detail. So unlike his father, whose sleeves are capped with wings, Loris's are highly textured, his highly textured jerkins have extended shoulders instead. And he wears a rose brooch on his jacket for Marjorie's wedding to Joffrey, but he, I've seen him in other scenes wearing it as well. And you can't see it here, but in a behind the scenes video featuring the wedding costumes, actor Finn Jones revealed that his vest is lined with matching fabric to his shirt, which just shows like the amount of detail that production goes through. Here's a better look at the detail of one of his shirts. The fabric is so thin that you can almost see through it. Here's another gorgeous look for Loris. In this close-up picture on the right is the embroidered fabric and smocking detail on the upper sleeve. And here's a close-up of the brass fasteners shaped like little flowers, maybe a bit like roses. The widow Lady Olena Terrell, the Terrell family matriarch, is also called the Queen of Thorns because of her witty barbs and she dresses modestly, befitting a widow of her age and stature. And she wears what looks like a pillbox hat and veil, but taken from the Middle Ages, the hat is more accurately called a fillet and the veil a wimple. And on the right, you can see the gorgeous beading uh, on the crown by Michelle Carragher. And the rose from their sigil is also, which is also incorporated often, uh, like the applique that we see on her puff sleeves. Elena wears a more matronly version of the handmaidens seen on the right, opting for ultimate coverage, choosing gathered full length sleeves over the crop sleeves of the young women and shawl collars. And her skirts tend to be fully gathered as well, unlike Marjorie and the handmaidens whose skirts are all A-lined. And notice that the footmen behind Elena are dressed in the same teal blue color. Elena wears this handcrafted rose embellishment attached to her jacket with ribbons. This one is custom made by Steenson's Jewelers in Ireland. Pictured here are both Loris's brooch on the top and Marjorie's belt on the bottom. Elena's is a much more elaborate version of Marjorie's. And according to Steenson's website, it states, each individual petal was rolled and shaped by hand using copper clay. The vine work was formed from brass wire and a mold was taken from real rosebuds to cast the beautiful silver bud details. According to his mother, Elena, Mace Tyrell has never been in battle except as Olena has stated, all he laid siege to was the banquet table in the command tent. So it's fitting with his oafishness that May should wear this highly decorated and ornamented plate armor. His helm is festooned with large ostrich plumes and the crown of the helm resembles a rose. 
It's not so far-fetched in reality. Here is the half-armor of Philip I of Castile from the Royal Armories Madrid in Spain. And according to their website, it says the most notable item related to this armor is the unusual helmet, which is patterned after an ecclesiastical beretta or a civilian hat of the period. Meanwhile, the Tyrell soldiers wear simple plate armor cuirass and pauldrons, elbow and wrist guards. And I can't, I can't find any reference to their shields. They have a sharp angle cut out of them, although it might be for their spears to go through. And in this image, the Tyrell soldiers get just a little protection from their gold hauberks or their shirts over their gambesons and these kind of weird goofy knee guards. And the chevron construction is similar to the Knights of the Veil vale breastplates. Horn Hill is the seat of House Tarly in the Reach. It is located southeast of High Garden. Its current lord is Randall Tarly, Samuel Tarly's father. And a word of warning, there will be some snark beyond this point, so please enter with caution. I was asked in my recent Q&A what my least favorite costumes on the Game of Thrones were. And while I said it that it was the Dorn costumes, I have to actually bump them in favor of the ladies of House Tarly. So the House Tarly gown seen here on Sam's mother, Lady Melissa, and his baby sister, Tala, with their short puff sleeves, I think have to be the worst look of the series. So my mouth actually dropped open when I saw them for the first time. And with such care that's been put into the looks of all the regions by designer Michelle Clapton, I think it's a shame, but these costumes, which were designed by season six replacement April Ferry, look like they're made from a bedspread or like vintage curtains or something. So because of the narrow shoulders, you can see that this dress doesn't sit properly on the actor's shoulders and it's puckered at the front. And I think it's because of the ridge from her corset, but I'm not actually sure. So Gilly's dress is just as awful and which I'll grant you might be intentional since the idea is that she's borrowed it from Tala. So it's far too tight across the bust and torso and the sleeves are really short. So, you know, really, I actually prefer Gilly's tattered wildling dress. Here is a look at the servants in green and red smock dresses from the family sigil. Sam's father Randall Tarley's costume is better, I think, although it looks more like leather armor than a jerkin, which I think is an odd choice to wear at the dinner table, although I suppose it could be hunting armor since he was out hunting with Sam's younger brother, Dickon Tarley. So Randall Tarley wears the Tarley sigil on the armor, as you see at the front. Dickon wears a leather jerkin similar to his father's. Dorn is the southernmost part of the continent of Westeros and has a harsh desert climate. Executive producer Frank Douglas says of the kingdom, it's a southern climate, it's a very luxurious kingdom, it's a world of pleasure seekers. So we went for things that were very loose and very sensual and were also inspired a little bit by Indian or Persian outfits. So just looking at some of the fabrics that Michelle Clapton chose, they bespeak a world of luxury and sensual pleasure. And again, that's a new element for us. Sun Spear is the seat of House Martell and the capital of Dorne. Michelle Clapton says, The introduction of Dorne is something I've been waiting for and I've been deliberately holding back on using their colors, the ochre yellow and the wonderful tans. We wanted them to have a very distinctive look. It's incredibly important to have those immediate visual cues to help you as a viewer. It was great to have these two characters lead into this next season when we'll be going to Dorne and we'll have a chance to really push things creatively. Like many fans of the series, I was really disappointed at Dorne, the Dorne storyline and sadly it has tainted my view of the costumes, although I will admit that they have grown on me as time has passed. Before we ever visit Dorne, we meet Prince Oberyn Martell, sometimes known as the Red Viper. He is easily one of my favorite characters and I loved what he wore. Michelle Clapton says of his costume, despite the substantial nature of some of the fabrics and the inclusion of metal sigils, Oberyn's costumes were in some ways 
quite feminine. There is something about the way that Pedro Pascal wore it, his masculinity, his total lack of fear of the feminine element that made it so strong and deeply masculine on him. Alaria Sand is Prince Oberyn's lover and mother of five sand snakes. Here is Clapton's rendering of Oberyn's armor and on the right is Alaria Sand's sand silk costume with and without her cloak. Clapton says of Oberyn's look, it's quite an Indian feel like crossover coat. Pedro just wore it brilliantly because it's actually quite a feminine look, but he wears it in a really masculine way. Big sashes and belts and the colors, it's also orange like burnt oranges and yellows and golds. It's quite fun just to start a look and then next year we can sort of go into it, but I think it will have a big Indian influence. The coat on the left, by the way, is made from the same Banera silk brocade fabric as Joffrey's aubergine coat that we see in season four. And Banera's brocade is produced in the city of Varanasi in India, known as one of the finest producers of silk brocades in the world. Here's a Turkish tunic from the late 16th century that looks similar to Oberyn's under tunic. This one is made from silk and metal from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Here's an example of an Iranian coat with some likeness to Oberyn's coat, also from the Met, and it's made from silk cotton with metallic fasteners from the 18th to 19th century. The style of coat is called an Antari. It's a garment popular during the Ottoman Empire for both men and women. And the Antari, unlike Oberyn's coat, it used no darts or additional seams beyond the side seams. So all the fullness in the skirt is created by the addition of gores or triangular panels. Here are two portraits that I thought I'd show you of Muhammad Shah Qajar. He's the third Shah of Persia from that ruled between 1834 and 1848 and during the Qajar dynasty. And in the portrait on the left, he wears a similarly fitted coat uh, like the Antari, which we also see on Oberon. Michelle Clapton says this of creating Oberyn's iconic leather armor. His armor was one of my favorite of all the armors. The contrast between the weight of the mountain's armor versus the least soft leather covering during the duel is visually very exciting. Giampaolo Grassi, the armor master, and his assistants stamped all the leather with the design and hand cut all elements. Being able to talk about it on the dummy, manipulated around the shape of the body, the changes in the ratio of the symbols, it evolved in the workroom and their input is immense, Michelle Clapton goes on to say. I think being part of the process leads to some of the most creative work. You can make replicas of Roman armor forever and it can be beautiful, but it's not the same. And so as a side note, I thought I mentioned that the helmet seen here in the exhibit was never actually worn in the trial by combat, which a lot of fans were actually kind of disappointed at. And while Oberon is called the Red Viper, the shoulder pieces, especially when you view them from the back, remind me of the armadillo inspired Dracula horseman costume that is seen in Bram Stoker's Dracula. That costume was designed by Japanese costume designer Eiko Ishioka. She actually won an Oscar for that. In case you're wondering how they get that awesome texture on the leather, they use this sort of leather stamping tool like the one seen here. And they can come in a variety of textures and be purchased online. Of Oberyn's mistress, Clapton says, Alaria Sand's style is very different from anything we've previously seen. And so it's quite revealing and it's actually sand wash silk. So it has a lovely flow. It's almost like a weightlessness to it. There are a lot of Indian influences, particularly with the fabrics. We sourced a lot of the fabric for the Dornish characters in India. I like the sand wash silks, the weight of it, and the depth of color. And like Daenerys, Ilaria has these exaggerated scale-like sh collar shoulder pieces, which are most likely, I think, inspired by the Viper. Of Ilaria's costume for Joffrey's wedding, Michelle Clapton says, I like the strength of her outfit being able to lift the cape away to this very simple sensual elegance, cut to the navel without revealing too much. It's a very assertive piece, 
both in movement and in color. I love to think of what Cersei's reacting uh, is when she sees it. After all, her daughter is now in Dorn. Alaria has a really lovely sort of chained headpiece, which I just thought, my God, it's such a great look. It's this thing of trying to find new areas of how people should look because we've obviously done so much now. The close-up shot on the right is the work of embroidery artist Michelle Carriger using an assortment of glass beads and brass jump rings. And this brocade shoulder piece is interchangeable with a stamped leather one. Here's another sand silk gown with a matching cape, this one in a beautiful midnight blue. However, she shows her power with the little bit of stamped leather cross armor similar to the one worn by Missende. Missende's armor, it's a little bit more cobra-like in keeping with Danny's clothing, as opposed to Ilaria's, which is more viper-like. Again, here is some beautiful beading detail by Michelle Carriger. Here, Ilaria wears a diaphanous silk organza gown in sort of a light pewter gray color. She wears it in season five when she gives Marcella Baratheon a deadly kiss goodbye. Michelle Carriger and her team created the beautiful metallic and ribbon embroidery for all the gowns worn by Marcella and the Sand Snakes. Clapton says of the gowns, the dresses were beautifully embroidered by my embroiderer Michelle, as usual, but I wanted it to look like a little pull of a strap and it would just drop to the ground. There was nothing to them just clouds. Here is a backlit shot of Nymeria and Tyene Sand in their silk organza dresses, the unlined gowns completely see-through. Nymeria Sand's rose-colored gown has ribbon embroidery. Tyene Sand wears cross armor similar to the embossed leather armor worn by her mother, Ilaria. Here is a close-up look at it taken from Michelle Carriger's website. And here's an example of some silk organza, this one in egg yolk yellow from Top Fabric in London. Prince Doran Martella was the ruler of Doran in the name of the king. He wears sumptuous Indian brocades like Oberyn and his son. Prince Tristan Martell is Prince Doran's youngest child. A 2015 Fashionista article says Tristan's outfit has a definite Indian inspiration. The fabrics actually came from India and the costume design team dyed them the vibrant color seen here. The large leather belt and chain come from Michelle Clapton's personal collection. Both Doran and Tristane's coats look like a slimmer version of the Indian choga. The choga is an Indian men's overgarment brought to India by the Mughal invasion in the 16th century. This exquisite Varanasi coat seen here, it's in stellar condition considering it actually dates back to the late 18th century. And this display is from the Woven with Silk Rockefeller Asian Textiles exhibit. And the coat is made from a gorgeous silk and gold wrap thread brocade. Here is Marcella Baratheon's gold gown on display from Michelle Carriger's website. The bra top underneath is sweet pink, a common color seen on Marcella. Marcella gives one of her many vacant looks while wearing this baby pink gown. I thought I'd point out that she's wearing a Lannister pendant. This gown has a more youthful, delicate, soft floral embroidery in keeping with her innocence. And in another vacant, why am I in this show, look for Marcella, as this fabulous wardrobe is wasted on her. I actually think this looks better on the mannequin than on her. Realizing that her character doesn't have much longer to live, Marcella pulls out this teen angst look, all the while wearing this lovely bias cut golden gown. Here's another perspective on the mannequin. This is what Michelle Clapton said to the reaction to the Sand Snake's armor. They're sexy, it's hot weather, it's a very liberal society. It looks too B-movie, but it's supposed to be this rather free place. It's hot and it's practical to wear light clothing. I just like the movement. Again, they wear suede trousers underneath and boots. And I just like the contrast of the very flowy dresses with really tough bits. When you need to fight, you put the tough armor over. I didn't really take too much issue with these costumes. Of the three daughters, I think Nermeria wore it best. It's just a simple silk shift with a hammered leather harness and belt over top. I like the little sand snake sigil plate seen here. 
Tie-in Sans costume, it bugs me a little bit more. I think it's the additional flap of fabric added over the tummy. I feel like this was a late addition to hide her stomach or something, but it actually just emphasizes it even more. And also her leather cross straps, they look warped for some reason. I'm not sure why. This one's my least favorite look, um, but it's partly be due to the casting, I think, of Keisha Castle Hughes as Obera Sand. You know, I adored her in Whale Rider. She, but here for some reason, she always looks like she's got poop under her nose. Okay. So Clapton did get a lot of flack for this costume in a scandal that was known as Nipplegate, where fans of the show thought that the bosom of the leather armor looked too well-defined. I like these looks a bit better. It kind of reminds me of Danny's Dothraki bodices. I'm not crazy about the armor of Dorne either. So the story goes that Michelle clapped and she saw some padded velvet armor in Florence years ago that she loved. And it provided the inspiration for this look, saying in an interview, it's built on leather and padding and velvet. And we decided each stud would be a sunburst on a leather piece studded through. It was a nightmare. I just decided it would be a lovely sensual way of wearing armor. They were very solid, actually. They were very protective. And uh, just to let you know, the team, they had to make about 25 of these in all. Here are some examples of this type of armor that Clapton used for inspiration. So on the left is Indian armored clothing made from layers of fabric faced with velvet and studded, just like the way that they did it on the show. And on the right is a reproduction from the Disney movie Haunted Mansion. It's an Indian coat of a thousand nails, as it's called, and the armor is made from layers of velvet faced fabric studded with brass nails. And just as a side note, fabric armor was used in India, in case you're wondering, as metal turned hot in the sun. So it, it did have an actual practical purpose. Here is another example, an Indian armor plated tunic from the 19th century. This embroidered and quilted knee length tunic is decorated in brass, forming a lattice of repeating medallions. That does it for this episode in my series on the costumes of Westeros. I hope that you enjoyed it and hopefully learned something too. I know that I did. And if you missed any of the other episodes in the series, I will leave a link in the description below so that you can catch up. And we're just days away from the new season. I'm so excited. And beginning the week of July 16th, I'm going to do a weekly show review for all seven episodes of season seven. And like always, Thank you for all of your awesome comments. Please keep them coming. And if you like what you see here, please like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you so much for watching.